Hi everybody, welcome to the Parallel Systems broadcast live stream. Tonight we are going to be talking about a very important subject. I got sent an article recently by David Rogers Webb, so the man who wrote the book, The Great Taking, and a friend of mine, and he sent me an article that really drew my attention and it also drew his too. So we're going to be talking about that tonight. Also, I wanted to share a little bit about another article that I found on Zero Hedge, which also links to the taking. So lots to talk about, eh? And, you know, it's been an interesting week. Let's just put it that way. One of my recent videos, it was the interview that I did with Rick Moon. It turned out to be the most controversial video on the channel, the most controversial video out of over 200 on the channel. And do you want, do you want to know why it is? Can you guess? Can you get guess which subject I touched upon, which sore spot, which sensitive spot I touched upon? Was it the uh, LGBT uh, community? Was it those guys? Was it the, uh, the BLM guys? What, what did I touch on? What did I discuss? That sent people, uh, that sent people into a into a frenzy, and I got a whole host of crazy comments. I'm talking like mentally unhinged, uh, foaming at the mouth, laser eyes. Oh, there's a big clue. Yes, it was my recent interview with Rick Moon where we discussed, and uh, we discussed Bitcoin, and I gave a rational take that it's an asset where you can earn some money, you can speculate, but it's a cycle; it will go up and it will go down. Now, of course, there's plenty of rational and thinking people out there, and I like to think my audience is pretty smart. I've got a pretty smart audience. I know them quite well. A lot of them are part of my community. I've got a private community, not just on Patreon. We've also got our own private space where we discuss homesteading, gardening, community building, all of the rest of it. So I know my community quite well, and I've got some people in there who are Bitcoin investors. I've got some people who are very passionate about Bitcoin. So we're not talking about those people. We're not talking about you and I, the normal people who have normal lives and normal conversations. We're talking about the people who are, let's say, on the fringes of society, the people who are a little bit frenetic, who have maybe taken one too many uh, boosters. Those people, I got some messages from those people. I had one guy who uh, sent me a message and said, Mike, you are wasting your life. You're living in the past, man. You're living in the past. And owning a farm is living in the past. And you're ruining your family's life. You should be investing in digital scarcity instead. So, you know, having your own food, having your own well, having your own off-grid systems, this is stupid. This is stupid. You don't need that stuff. If we have a food crisis, we can eat our microchips, of course. Uh, what you actually need is some uh, something completely intangible. Intangible and unable to be used in a real crisis. That's what I need. So I got all of the uh, <laughs> crypto sexuals, as, uh, <laughs> as Neil and John said in the live chat. Uh, Jock said in the live chat. Neil and Jock, yes. So I got the crypto sexuals after me and... Um, Listen, everyone, you are entitled to invest in whatever you want. And uh, I'm quite happy to, for people to speculate or invest however they want. But guess what? We're all allowed an opinion. And not everyone, not everyone wants to paint their bedroom orange and wear tight little orange knickers when they go out and wear the laser eyes and, you know, tattoo themselves with the, with the logo and go to BitcoinDating.com uh, and marry a... Marry another Bitcoiner who's probably another bloke because, let's face it, the women don't really care too much. Uh, not everyone wants to do that. Not everyone wants to be all in. What? Not everyone wants to sleep in uh, in Bitcoin pajamas. It's just the way it is, guys. Some of us have life. Some of us have uh, reason for living beyond uh, orange tokens that uh, are magic and don't exist. Some of us actually have uh, things to do. I've got animals to tend. You know, I've got Coco Coco Mama out there. She needs looking after. So. Uh, so that was quite an experience, and uh, we all had a good laugh about it over here because, you know, like I said, it's uh, it's as my as my good friend Rick said in the interview himself, it's uh, it's not water for ducks back. What did he call it? He said you need to be a Teflon rhino these days because, you know, there's a lot of cult members out there, and it doesn't matter what what cult they're in. They could be in the rainbow flag cult. They could be in the the fist cult. They could be in the uh, in whatever cult. They're all doing the same thing. They're all giving up their critical thought for ideology. They're all 
losing their minds because people have a different view and opinion and we must we must die we must break the heathens you can, if you don't agree with me then you're the enemy kind of attitude and you know that's not what we're about over here what we're about over here on parallel systems broadcast is uh, actually living in the real world you know not living in this fantasy where you, your whole life spent staring into screens we're out there we're building community we're growing food we're taking care of each other we actually have a life like a real life a genuine real life outside of this construct here and uh that's the way it should be that's the future it was the past as well you know we're living in a in a blip of history where you can actually not grow your own food where you can not have any self-sufficiency where you can actually convince yourself that the you're going to be taken care of by the same people who are promising you that they will certainly not take care of you in the coming years so let's see where this one plays out i'm pretty nice over here i'm pretty comfortable on the farm <laughs> uh, i'm not regretting my decisions just yet to have a food store and to have a well and to have animals and i, I can't see myself regretting it anytime soon it's, it's quite nice so uh, so we'll see what we'll see how this one plays out but uh that if you want to check out the most controversial episode if you want to check it out uh, you can go wa watch that video. It was about two videos back. It was my interview with Rick Moon. And uh, and yeah, so let's get into tonight's episode. Let's see what we've got to discuss. I've got some articles ready to go. So we're going to start with discussing the central clearing parties because this one is intrinsic to understanding tonight's episode. So bear with me with this one. And let's start with Humpty Dumpty was pushed. Humpty Dumpty was pushed. That's Mr. Potato Head from the Toy Story film. Now, the central clearing parties, you will know, are the ones who take on the counterparty risk when we buy our equities or we clear bonds. So let's imagine that I'm doing a deal. I'm a bank and I'm doing a deal with a brokerage house uh, and I'm going to put up some collateral and they're going to put, they're going to take the collateral. It will go through a central clearing party. Uh, if I was going to buy, for example, some uh, some bonds, somebody will take the cash, somebody will take the bonds, they'll clear it and they'll take on the county party risk in case the person with the bonds doesn't fulfill, then the person with the cash would get screwed if he'd already sent it. So there's a middleman, that's called the central clearing party. And they pretty much take on all of the liabilities during these trades. They also are the ones that hold all of the assets. So let's imagine you buy some stocks. You might think, oh, my stock's about the broker. No, they're held at the central clearing party. Your broker has a contractual claim to those securities that are held at the central clearing party. And this is the whole problem of the system, right? You don't have property rights anymore. You don't have the property rights. They're actually being held with full property rights by the central clearing party. Now, in the great taking, what's happened is the GSIB, so the systemically important financial inst institutions across the world, have all guaranteed themselves legally that in the event of a financial crisis, they will be bailed out and they will get to take the collateral. Now, the problem there is the collateral is everything and anything that's within the system. The stocks, the bonds, the property, the farmland, the factories, the machinery, the plant equipment, everything that's got a financial wrapper around it, so a loan, everything doesn't have to be on loan. Literally, all of the stocks and bonds that are in the system, they'll all go. And the systemically important banks, the JP Morgans, the HSBCs, they've all guaranteed themselves that in the end game, everyone else will be allowed to collapse. And as that house of cards comes falling down, it all gets swept up. All the collateral in the system gets swept up and handed over to them. Now, you need to read the book or watch the documentary if you want to truly understand this one. But I just wanted to make clear who the central clearing parties are. Now, the European one is called Euroclear. And you can see in front of me, I've got the book, The Great Taking. And in 2020, Euroclear published an article where they was discussing the possibility that the central clearing parties themselves fail. Now, you might think, well, how could that happen? Well, very simply, they are undercapitalized themselves. So why would you want the central clearing parties to fail? Well, you wouldn't. We wouldn't, because if the central clearing parties fail, all of the assets that they're looking after will get handed off to who? to the systemically important banks. So you don't want the central clearing party to fail. You don't want it to fail, and I don't want it to fail. Well, actually, I actually don't care because it's not going to affect me, but I care about other people. So that's the problem. And in 2020, Euroclear published an article, article discussing the potentiality that they would fail. And this one's very interesting. So what it actually says is that if they fail, 
there will be a resolution. And those banks, the banks that I just mentioned, they get the collateral. So just let me read you a line from this one first. And the uh, heading was system-wide and contagion effects and interconnectedness. This is in the report. Because the scenarios were specific to each central clearing party, the results cannot be aggregated to simulate total losses at the level of the financial system. Therefore, system-wide effects were not considered. The analysts did not take into account the underlying economic circumstances that could cause the simultaneous default of four clearing members at each of the seven CCPs, the likelihood of such circumstances, or the potential impact of the same clearing members defaulting. So what they essentially said there was we have not wargamed or tested at all what would happen or what environment might lead to the failing of the CCP. So they're basically washing the hands of it in this report and saying we're not going to tell you how it might happen. Isn't that interesting? Now listen to this part. The covered clearing agency standard requires plans for orderly recovery and wind, da wind down. We would seek to wind down the failed entity and concurrently shift our services to a third party. What will happen is essentially a transfer of services. There would be some assignment of assets. There would be a service agreement. Hopefully, this is something we will never have to do, but we do need to be prepared. As many of you know, what will drive this potentially happening may not be something we've seen historically, but the value comes in planning. So they understand that they could fail, but they're not telling us how they're going to fail or what's going to happen afterwards. Now, what David Rogers Webb mentions during this is that the capitalization of the CCP is $3.5 billion, and that's for the biggest in the world, which is the American one. Remember, the American one holds all of the assets for the entirety of the U.S., all of BlackRock shares, all of the brokerage houses, all of the private investors, everything is held by one entity. All of the bonds issued by the Federal Reserve, they're all held by the DTCC. And they also hold a lot of the shares of people in Europe. So not just Euroclear, that's the European one, but if we've got American shares, they're all held at the DTCC. So you think something that's that literally is dealing in quadrillions of dollars worth of transactions each year. We're talking like a quadrillion in transactions worth of uh, dollar in dollar value each year. How much capitalization do you think they'd have to protect them from failure? They're dealing with the entire world's wealth. It's 3.5 billion. <laughs> 3.5 billion. 3.5 billion with a tiny little b. So we're talking uh, something like, what's that? Well, Bill Gates probably farts 3.5 billion. So not a lot, not a lot. So why would you do that? Why would you have such a low capitalization? Well, let's uh, let's consider this recent article. Now, this article came out on Russia Today. I was sent it by David Webb, and it says seizing Russian money could devastate Euroclear. Now, remember, Euroclear is the European clearing party that I just mentioned. And it says the entire global financial system could be jeopardized if Euroclear, the main EU clearing house holding hundreds of billions in frozen Russian money, is sued over using the money to fund Kiev, a senior bloc official has told Reuters. Brussels, Brussels should withhold a tranche of cash as a safety buffer in, in case such an event uh, is triggered. Now, just to remind you all, as the war in Ukraine began, what happened was Euroclear and all of the Western powers started freezing Russian assets. Now, a lot of those Russian assets were held, well, they was held centrally, just the same way that your assets are held centrally. Now, this is the problem with centralization, is that overnight, everything can be confiscated and frozen up. And the rule of law doesn't have to be followed. They can literally just say, we're taking your assets because we've already got them and the property rights are held there. Now, of course, there is international law as well. But Russia had $300 billion worth fro frozen by Euroclear. And that's where it sits now. Now, since that time, they've been trying to figure out how they're going to take these assets and use them for whatever purposes they want. They say they're going to hand it to Ukraine. Uh, they'll, probably get, they'll probably give it to Ukraine in the form of loans. Uh, and that's what they're claiming they're going to do. Uh, but there's a problem with that in that those bonds and those assets are actually owned by people. Irrespective of what's happening globally during wartime, there is an international treaty and there's also international rule of law. Now, wherever you stand on any war, 
if you think it's okay to just go around taking other people's property, then good luck with that because that'll happen to you one day. What happens on the macro begins in the micro, uh, will end up in the micro as well. If you think it's okay to take other people's assets, uh, like the Bank of England, for example, when they confiscated hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Venezuela's gold, like the US when they went into Iraq and just took all the gold, uh, and they also confiscated a load of assets uh, from um, Saddam Hussein and his family, and they locked all that up, and it started to do its way around the system. And I think actually, I think I'm right in thinking that um, Gaddafi as well, when they went into Libya, they confiscated a lot of his accounts. He had some Swiss accounts with hundreds of millions of dollars worth uh, of dollars in it. Uh, he also had a lot of assets that were income bearing and nobody knows who's getting the dividends on them, but they're still being paid out somewhere. So this is international theft that happens. So whether you, wherever you stand on that one, <clears throat> my point here is that it's not good. It's not good if you if you just have uh, countries marauding around the world and taking other people's stuff, because if there is no property rights internationally, then I don't think we'll have them domestically either eventually. Now, here is an article that was on Reuters, which just explains some of the plans, the potential plans for those assets. Confiscation. Some international poly policymakers and lawyers say the immobilized Russian reserves can simply be confiscated under a doctrine of international law called countermeasures. The assets would be sold or collateralized and the proceeds handed to uh, Ukraine or to a dedicated reconstruction fund. That's one thing that could happen. Uh, but I've also heard that that can be challenged legally, that if you confiscate the assets using this mechanism, and it says here, others raise concerns that it would go against international norms and open a legal Pandora's box, given it would be something of precedent, and Russia would be able to challenge it in the courts. Previous examples of such seizures include Iraqi assets after Iraq's 1990 invasion of Kuwait and German assets after World War II but they happened after the war was ended and not while the, whilst the war was raging on. Another thing they spoke about doing was taking the profits, so siphoning off the profits of all of these bonds and handing that to Ukraine. Uh, another thing that they mentioned they could do is to wait for the assets to mature and then uh, siphon that off. And a final thing that they mentioned was reparation bonds, where they would start issuing bonds to uh, to mugs, I mean, sorry, to investors in Europe, and these bonds would be backed with the promise that if they legally got Russia to pay for the damage in Ukraine, you would then get your interest paid out of Russia's payments for the damage they caused in Ukraine. Now, I don't know what the odds you think there are on Russia paying for anything that's happened in Ukraine, but I would put that somewhere between uh, zero and zero and zero maybe a little bit more zero. So if you bought those bonds, what kind of interest rate would you want on that? I think you'd want more interest rate than uh, a Brazilian uh, a Brazilian uh, government, uh, government uh, sovereign bond because you'd probably be looking at a few thousand percent you'd want because I don't think you're going to get paid. So these are all uh, nonsense things that are happening. But let's go back to the article. Now we've kind of made sense of what's going on. So Russia's uh, asking what what's going to happen to our 300 billion in holdings and Euroclear is now saying that they're going to start handing this off to Kiev. And it says the EU is reportedly fast-tracking the decision to send Kiev the first tranche of $3 billion worth of profit, profits generated from Russian frozen assets. Now, why does this matter to us? What's it got to do with the taking? Well, listen to this. Should the West proceed with ex expropriating the funds, the Russian central bank is likely to seize around 33 billion of Euroclear money, which is held in the National Securities Depository in Moscow. So the Moscow Securities Depository also has a load of funds from Euroclear. Similarly, there are other places in other jurisdictions that is holding assets also for Russia, and Russia can actually sue in those countries too. And I think one of them's Hong Kong, the other one's Dubai. So Russia may also be able to seize Euroclear cash from those depositories. Now listen to this, Brussels will have to ensure that there is no breach of financial stability, an unnamed EU official told Reuters on Tuesday. The moment the war ends and all settlements can be made, all the money that was provisionally retained will also be transferred to Ukraine. But we need a significant amount in Euroclear because Euroclear will face a lot of claims. Now remember what it says in the taking book about these CCPs being under collateralized and that if they 
have a default because that 3.5 billion they've got, and we're talking 300 billion here, 3.5 billion for America. I'm not sure what Euroclears is, but I would imagine it's less than the American one. So let's imagine that they get sued. If that suit was more point, more than 3.5 billion, they would go bust. They would go bust. That in, in and of itself would trigger the catastrophic failure of the clearing system and therefore all of the brokerage houses would be done for because all of the assets are within the CCP. Now, what happens to those assets? Well, on the other side of those assets is a load of banks who are being guaranteed legal certainty that they will be bailed out in a crisis. I'm just going to pause a second so I can have some water. Okay, let's just check everything's going to plan. Okay, yeah, so they've been guaranteed that in a crisis, they will have legal certainty to those assets. So just think about how this is working. You've got the central clearing party. You've got all of the banks. The banks are safe. The banks are protected. The CCP is not safe. And the CCP is being given all of the liability now because they are the ones that are being told, you must send this money to Ukraine. Now, I don't know where it's going to end up if it goes there. <laughs> We can only imagine, we can only imagine Ukraine. MPs in Ukraine have 52,000 uh, shit coins, sorry, Bitcoins. 52, or is it 42? 42,000 Bitcoins over there. Um, and they are turning themselves into the fourth industrial revolution centerpiece. So they have embraced cryptography, blockchain, smart contracts, NFTs. They're going the whole hog over there. Everything is getting tokenized. All of the land's getting tokenized. They love the stuff. They're all about it. You, If you like Bitcoin, move to Ukraine. They love the stuff. And their MPs have got an awful lot of it, almost as much as some countries. The US has another 200 to 300,000. We don't actually know. Uh, the FBI did the Silk Road confiscation. Sailor's now got 200,000. And uh, yeah, he likes the US. Uh, <laughs> he's good friends with them over there. So there's a lot, there's a lot of it centralized in these hands. Um, and... Going back to this article, it says Moscow has repeatedly warned that it will respond in kind if the West goes through the threats, go, sorry, goes through with the threats to confiscate Russian assets. The finance ministry said last month that Western states and companies themselves still have holdings in Russia that could be jeopardized. So they're saying we've still got assets in our country of Western uh, corporations. We'll take that. But I think the key part here is Euroclear has 3.7 trillion in assets in custody. Those assets, if Euroclear fails, could be taken. They could be up for taking by the secured creditors. It says, if it runs out of liquidity amid a litany of lawsuits, the Belgian central bank may be forced to withdraw its license, causing a global financial crisis, the official warned. Their words are not mine. A number of Western countries remain divided over expropriating Russia's assets to give aid to Ukraine, whilst the US and UK support the direct seizure of the assets. Some EU member states, including France and Germany, have recently warned that the move could negatively affect financial stability and erode trust in the euro status as a reserve currency. Uh, well, there's not much trust in that reserve currency anyways. However, my point here in all of this is, you can always imagine, you can almost imagine the headlines, can't you, that um, Russia triggers collapse of central clearing party and then... Who knows what happens next? We know who's set up to win on this one. But here's another article that I wanted to share with you. This one's from Zero Hedge. <clears throat> what could go wrong? Wrong. Basel III Endgame stress backs rebirth of synthetic credit risk sh sharing. And it says that the banks are now using something called synthetic risk transfer deals where they create... Basically, what they're doing is they're paying other people to take on the default risk on their um, on their bonds, on their loans, and a whole host of uh, dog shit uh, products that they've created. And I'll read you what the line says. They're simply credit-linked notes, which have been relatively uncommon since the great financial crisis, offering high to mid-double-digit yields for borrowers willing to accept the implied credit default swap that effectively transfers the credit risk tied to a pool of loans such as CREs. So what the banks are doing is they're taking these loans and probably whatever other products they've got in there and um, derivatives and all, all kinds of stuff. And they're saying, right, we don't want the default risk of this. So they're paying other people to take the default risk. Now, just think about that for a second. That's essentially allowing the banks once more to carte blanche, allow themselves to be absolved of any punishment and to pass on that transfer risk 
But who actually really is the counterparty to all of this? Because if all of those counterparties fail and they don't fulfill when we had these uh, credit events where we have some kind of systemic crisis, the banks are protected. They're going to fail. And then who else is counterparty now to their failure? You guessed it. It's the central clearing party again. So they're creating these credit default swaps. But essentially, this is just storing up dynamite in the basement once more because it doesn't matter if the banks uh, renege or not. They're secured. They're going to be fine. The secured credit is good. And if they don't have to pay these things because they're doing the credit default swaps or they're called here the SRTs, the counterparty to that, they'll just fail. And then it goes back to the CCP because they're the main counterparty for everyone. Then they'll fail again. So it just goes back around in a circle, just like with the Euroclear one. And it says here, specifically in SRT transaction, a bank earmarks a pool of assets on its balance sheet and buys credit default protection on the first 5 to 15% of the losses of that pool. So if losses materialize, the holders of the SRTs absorb the hit, according to BlackRock. The renaissance of these vehicles is driven by a combination of high rates and also the forthcoming Basel III regulations, which will force banks to hold more capital to cover potential losses. While European banks have been the biggest users of such transactions in previous years, the big rise in SRT volumes will come from large Wall Street banks under pressure to boost their regulatory capital requirements. So they are essentially replaying the exact same thing that they did going into 2008. And we're going to see all of the same problems in the next crisis. Everyone's going to be doing uh, a case of past the parcel, past the parcel uh, of debt, and there's going to be nothing left. It's musical chairs, but there'll be no chairs left at the end because there's so many people that are just acting as counterparty for one another. And then you've got the ultimate counterparty at the top. And if that fails, like this uh, book talks about, then it's game over for everyone except those that have been assured that they will get the collateral. And it says here in this, let me just find the... Um, the part where it says. Where are we? Okay, this is the important bit. Is the investor protected against the insolvency of an intermediary, which is the clearing party? And if so, how? And this is the New York Fed's response. The Federal Reserve. An investor is always vulnerable to a securities intermediary that does not itself have interest in a financial asset sufficient to cover all of the security entitlements that it has created in that financial asset. If the secured creditor has control over the financial asset, it will have priority over entitlement holders. If the securities intermediary is a clearing corporation, let me just repeat this one. If the securities intermediary is a clearing corporation, the DTCC or Euroclear, the claims of its creditors have priority over the claims of entitlement holders. All of the people that are saying the mechanism's wrong or the book was wrong, uh, it's diversion, it's subterfuge. The reality is there. The New York Fed sees it themselves. If the securities intermediary is a glaring corporation, the claims of its creditors have priority over the claims of entitlement holders. So going back to this article called What Could Go Wrong?, well, we know what could go wrong. Defaults. We have a financial slowdown. A financial tri crisis is triggered because something in the system manifests. One of the many time bombs goes off. Then all of a sudden, you have a game of past the parcel of debt and it's found out that nobody can fulfill on their promises. That goes then to the CCP at the top. They default because they are undercapitalized. Then the collateral gets scooped up and it goes to the banks. <clears throat> it's actually a, a it, it's an extremely cunning and I would say quite sinister mechanism, but also a very sophisticated one in the way that it works. And it says in its paper, BlackRock cited the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and other regional banks as a factor driving the growth in the market for regulatory capital securities. It's truly a transformational moment is what somebody said. We have seen this movie before, though. Of course, the quants have their models perfectly calibrated to synthetically transfer that risk at a premium that pays big bonuses. But after scraping away the copulas and the codependency, this is nothing more than a game of hot potato. Who can hold the potato long enough to earn a decent yield before it permanently scars your hand? Of course, there is always the option of the Fed put 
Should the fecal matter truly strike the rotating object, however, let history be thy lesson. Federal Reserve-backed SPVs will come to the rescue to recollateralize <laughs> the new TBF market participants. Okay, let's take a pause for a second. Okay, back to the main screen. So that was what I wanted to discuss tonight was these articles that I have been looking at. And ultimately, you know, I think at this stage of the game, it's a case of distract the masses whilst these things actually happen behind the scenes. And it's up to the individual to, to I guess, kind of make sense of those things and to say, do I think that this is going to be something that's going to affect me? Is this something that I should worry about? Should I just YOLO on Pepe going instead and uh, go go snort some blow and have a holiday in Las Vegas for five months. It's up to the individual how they make sense of this stuff. But I would say that when I look at what they are actually doing, it really does seem to me like a... Uh, I Imagine if you put a group of um, people with dementia in a room together and left them there for, for, for five days. It's, it's kind of like that. You know, it's getting more and more ridiculous the more we look at it. And the things that they're coming up with right now... It really is a case of we're just trying, we actually have no idea what we're doing. We're just literally trying to pass the parcel as long as we can until the inevitable happens. Like it is inevitable that at some point we will have a major downturn. It's inevitable at that point everyone will start to default on one another. And it's inevitable that these mechanisms will then come to the fold. Now you might say, well, maybe they bail out the system at that point. Yeah, yeah, definitely they could do that. They could step in and say, we're going to bail out the CCPs. We're going to bail out these smaller banks. We're going to bail out these hedge funds. We're going to bail out everyone and anyone. But what, is, what actually is that? That is completely hyperinflationary. They're just going to print the money. And then they're going to own everything as well because they'll take all the assets. There's no way out of this one. There's no way out of this one, folks. It's a, it is a giant Ponzi scheme. And uh, I know people have been saying this for a long time. I've been saying it since I started my channel. However, I would say the world is getting more and more warped as we go down to this. And this goes back to some of those people that we spoke about at the start. The psychology of people is really getting warped. And they're, they're clinging on to any hope that they can get, you know. Another thing that we're seeing is this manifestation of uh, of, of of just greed and self interest and narcissism. I think towards the end of these systems, people become much more self centered and focused on meism, you know, and that's what happened at the end of the Roman Empire as as well. It was focused on everything that could be uh, about oneself, you know, narcissus and. Uh, indulgence and greed and all about me, 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 my needs, my wants. Uh, and I think we're going to see more of that. I think we're going to see that manifest on hold uh, on on uh, on mass. But I think on the other side of that as well, there's gonna, there are groups of people who are already separating themselves from these uh, groups and saying, actually, yeah, that looks like that looks like a bad path because you know at the end of the day they always lose. They always lose. We don't need to worry about who wins and loses. It's obvious who's going to lose in this. It's anybody who has ideologically attached themselves to that way of thinking and that system, which is why, of course, they want people to be in all of those assets, everything. You know, the cryptos, the Bitcoin, uh, the stock market, everything and anything. They want you to be involved because that's where they need people to be invested in the markets, believing in the system. Uh, pumping it up whilst they just go behind the scenes and they just laugh and control it all. They, they, you know, they've got protection. They're going to be fine. They understand the trajectory of this. They know that they are essentially not going to lose in a system that they control all of the levers and pulleys on. You know, if you can control all of the different parts of the system, it doesn't matter. You know what we think is un unbreakable and and impenetrable. It's not true. Because they have, they've got so many mechanisms that they can use and so many metrics they can mess with. And ultimately, they control everything from the power to the waterways, to the sewage systems, to the roads, to the traffic lights. You know, I don't think people realize just how much control is held within the system. You know, they can control all of the exchanges. They can control all of the brokerage houses. BlackRock own majority shares in four out of the five largest uh, crypto Bitcoin miners in the world. Everything is centralized. People don't realize the whole thing is centralized and everything can be influenced from afar, whether it's uh, stocks and bonds, cryptos, oil markets, the whole lot. I don't think any of it is free. None of those things are free markets. 
is the illusion of free markets. So I think to tie yourself to that system is what they want. They want you to be invested in something, anything, just go into it. But ultimately, the way out of this one has to be to start to separate yourself from it, to, to remove yourself from it. And people who you know would mock somebody for wanting to have some independence when it comes to energy or food or water, like those people have lost their shit. Like they've they they they're way out there. They're way out there in the fields. Like naturally, they're not in the fields. They're way out there in uh in in the smart city. <laughs> That's where they are. You know, they've tied themselves to a system that has literally promised them that they're going to take it all, and they are investing in that system. In terms of all of its infrastructure, all of its promises, all of its uh, all of its future entitlements and benefits. You know, AI and the fourth industrial revolutions, digital ID, smart contracts, like. If you go with that system, that's what you're accepting. There's no two ways about it. You can't have both. So it's like, if you want true freedom, then you have to start separating yourself from it. And that means, unfortunately, you know, you're know, you gonna have to live something more simple because that's gonna collapse that system. It is gonna come down under its own weight. I mean, this is what we're talking about in this video. It's like we are talking about a literal systemic collapse. Now, it doesn't mean that it's gonna be uh, Mad Max and you're not gonna be able to eat or feed yourself. Uh, it means you'll have zero, zero autonomy and independence, that everything will be handed to you on a plate by the state with rules and regulations attached. You'll have to have a smartphone. You'll have to have a digital wallet. Everything will immediately turn into that system that nobody actually wants. But you won't have a choice because that's the only thing that's going to be available to you if you don't have some independence and autonomy. And I don't think people understand that, that that's how easy it is. That's how simple it is. If you want a new world... All you have to do is have the infrastructure up and running. Well, the infrastructure exists. The infrastructure is already there. People are already using digital wallets and uh, smartphones and people are already embracing those technologies because they think it's going to save them. It's not. It's just going to put them straight in the system. So I think um, the only way to stand a chance of that is to first and foremost, you need to be around people who are already pretty much, you know, half out the system. So it's people who have some, some kind of self-sufficiency and then, also, to uh, to uh, have some you know some some systems that you can con you can con control that are not going to be centrally controlled in a crisis, because once a crisis hits, it's like it, all bets are off. Like everything's going to change very fast, and you'll come back to a different world. Anything that you think, well, the way people think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to be like that. I think it's going to be very different, and uh, and it will happen fast. So that's that's the that's the that's the bad news. The good news is if you are already actually you know if, if if you're if you're more bothered now put it this way if you're more bothered now if you're living in a city in a flat and eating takeout for tea every night and you've got no garden no food no wood or you haven't even tried you know you don't have a food store you haven't even you know you haven't even tried to do something you don't have a water filter and you're bothered you're thinking oh i'm gonna buy some shit coins and get rich it's like you have lost the plot. You have seriously gone off the deep end here. That that is what you would focus on in a time like this. I would say you are a mark with a big M on your head. You are precisely the kind of person that they are looking for. That is just the mindset that they hope you would have right now, that you are not doing something to get you and your family ready. So, uh, so it's up to individuals how they play this one. You know, you can ignore it. You can wait for something to happen and then try and act, but it'll be too late in my opinion. It'll be similar to 2020 when nobody knew what was coming. It was just all of a sudden blindsided, but it would be far, 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 far worse this time. You know, the financial part is, is, is huge. And I think we're getting there. I think we're getting close now. Um, I think they're not the same. Uh, okay, I'm going to leave it there for tonight's show, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this live stream. Not sure this one will be allowed to stay up. It's got a lot of, uh, a lot of buzzwords in it. But uh, thanks for listening. Hope you all have a good rest of the week. Uh, check out the Patreon for the new audio newsletter. That was one of the best I got told. As someone said, it was one of the best you've ever done, and they're getting better every week. It's a good one if you are looking to uh, get yourself prepared and you want some more specific advice. Similarly, new podcast out, parallelmike.com. Go to that website and click on latest episode. Had a fantastic conversation with a man called Jason Leosatis. And uh, this was a hopeful one. It was a very hopeful one. We talk about the changing of the guard, these new energies that are in play. 
And we talk about how people who want to tie themselves to that old system, well, they're going down with the ship. But for the rest of us, it's uh, it's a new, new world ahead. So we best start getting ready for it. And I think many of us are. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you in the next one.